Um, okay, everybody. Um, uh, okay. Um, just a quick for five minutes. Uh, um, uh, this, this training is brought to you by Malaysian Youth Education. Uh, we have uh, kind uh, friends from DAC who let us use this uh, uh, this space. Uh, we also recently got some some uh, 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 some some, uh, some support from Kazana. Um, and also, we are trying to uh, talk to a few more partners to, to support this training series. Okay, this is a quick introduction. Uh, we're going to uh, share a little who is Pasatuan Belia Kuruan Dikrit, which is our registered organization, uh, Power Shift Malaysia, and Malaysian Education. So, Pasatuan Belia Kuruan Dikrit is basically a, a, a organization registered with ROI, Registrar of Youth, under the KKS. Um, since 2013, we have been running our uh, uh, and, and our, our movement uh, objective is towards uh, clean, renewable energy source and safe kind of future for all. Yeah, because we are living in one earth, uh, we're not just fighting for religion, we are fighting for the world as well. So uh, this is a short timeline uh, where uh, to begin with the global power shift where some of us went to and then come back, we uh, registered ourselves, started the annual uh, climate change youth training. 2013, we continue in 2014. And this year we expanded our program um, to MYD, and Malaysian Youth Delegation, which is training young people to uh, attend the United University conferences. And of, of course, last weekend, uh, we just finished, concluded our Power Shift Malaysia 2015. Um, and we had about 50 over participants, and it was successfully done. Um, so basically, uh, Power Shift Malaysia and MYD is two separate programs. Uh, conducted under this uh, auspicious youth of managers. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we do is, uh, on, besides these two things, we, we, we attend, we were invited to various talks and, and conferences with, our, uh, with many universities. We also uh, support uh, international uh, movement uh, gatherings, like recently we have this uh, Global Divestment Day. Uh, uh, we held a, a movie screening on, on the movie. Uh, in Korea. At the same time, with three other cities in ASEAN, Ho Chi Minh, and also Bangkok. Uh, we also do we engage uh, various organizations as well. We engage the uh, Bar Council's Environment Climate Change Committee. Uh, we also engage our uh, IRES, uh, our Ministry of Youth uh, uh, Engagement Research Center, where one of the topics they're talking about during the time of the rationalization of the uh, uh, fuel subsidy. So we will I think we are the only proponent in the room that supported this policy <laughs> uh, in the room of many youth uh, organizations. Luckily, then. Um, of course, uh, we got invited to many other um, um, uh, engagement with uh, various uh, uh, kind of events. Uh, on the one on the right is actually the recently held uh, ASEAN Youth Forum in conjunction with our uh, opening of the ASEAN Festival before the ASEAN meeting uh, recently mm -hmm. this year. So we also participated in some, uh, we also uh, put out statements uh, uh, like on the right hand side is uh, of our support su support to our government's uh, uh, decision to cut our fossil fuel. Um, also against the nuclear and, and some of the uh, wise news of our worker. And we try to reach out to as many people as possible uh, using various uh, mediums. Uh, like for example, today we are also using uh, YouTube and, and Google Hangout to reach out to as many people as possible. Uh, PowerShift Annual Training Camp, uh, we workshop uh, more on, on skills training, uh, how to get young people to get more active and, and take uh, uh, the climate change issue into their own hands and how can they do something about it. Uh, MYD is something, something new, something, something exciting, uh, where we have 20 young people selected and now been undergoing training since June this year until November. Then hopefully by December, they can go to Paris and, and be useful there. Um, we aim to became, become the voice of Malaysian youth at the COPS. And um, what's our aim, you know? Very, very, very importantly, we want to represent our Malaysian youth, uh, our, our ideals, uh, what, what, what you hope to achieve, what you hope the uh, negotiations to achieve, uh, bringing our Malaysian youth voice to them. Um, being, being there, we want to hold our leaders accountable 
uh, whatever uh, Dr. Gary's teams and Dr. Gary and team uh, say and act on behalf of our Malaysian citizens, mm -hmm. uh, we will uh, hopefully we will be witness to uh, what, whatever things they're going to do and, and take leadership during the conference. Um, how one of the thing, one of the thing what we, we are doing is so we're doing reporting. Uh, whatever we see, whatever we do, whatever we learn, whatever we observe, uh, what our Malaysian negotiators do, we will record it, we will blog about it, we will write newsletter uh, and, and put it in a language that Malaysians understand and bring back the news back to the whole country. Of course, we bring the voice of people who are suffering already, uh, like our friends uh, on the frontline community who have bad uh, uh, bloods and, and the crop, crop failure and also many other uh, uh, Issues around the country to, to to bring forward our voice of people are uh, basically are uh, very underrepresented uh, for this part of the world in, in, in corps. And of course, to, to learn to 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 gain network with other youth organisations um, and also uh, learn about the whole process of the contribution. So what we've done so far. Um, <laughs> So what we're doing there is, of course, we, we, we try to report, we try to be represented, we try to make statements, we try to monitor our negotiators and, 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 and follow them wherever they go. Uh, we, we try to track them, uh, which which they're strong, or are they having, are they, are they, are they even eating their lunch, you know, we should, we should force feed them, which they're healthy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Perry, uh, you must have good coffee, so yeah. uh, there's a tip, you know, uh, for the morning. <laughs> uh, we, have, we have joined regionally, um, we, uh, we have attended and uh, supported Asian Fellowship where we are trying to come up with an ASEAN statement, an ASEAN position statement, hopefully to be done uh, by October and uh, to, to submit to our various leaders in this region. Uh, and of course this is the MYD training series where we not only just, uh, not only just uh, going there as a, a be just being there, but we want to be there to be effective, you know, learn the ins and outs and, and, and stuff of feedback uh, like to, to actually be good in the entire state So, yeah, so basically that's it. Um, some of the previous speakers or trainers that we had is we have uh, media training by the ASBs, uh, which is one of the uh, editor from Astro. Um, Lynn, uh, who is one of the, uh, she is the editor of uh, Eco, uh, Eco, of yes, Eco. Yeah. Chris, uh, a part of the climate negotiator, climate, uh, climate tracker. Um, Shalom, Anthony, they are uh, very, very, very experienced uh, local NGO, and especially environment and climate change. And hopefully they can get with this one. He seems <laughs> not replying in your Yet, uh, uh, next week, next week we are getting Hillary. Next week we are getting Hillary. Uh, so we we'll get a good uh, uh, view from uh, climate justice and, and, and uh, developing country point. Uh, we are still getting a time with Dr. Brendan Tanga. Uh, Dr. Brendan Tanga is an IPCC uh, scientist. Uh, so yes, so so if you can see that we have a mix, uh, mix uh, in not not just one track of of, of, of training, we have a mixed track of uh, many views that hopefully our young people can, can absorb and understand it all. So, so that, that's pretty much NYD and then power generation. Okay. <laughs> um, um, next, moving forward, I think I would like to invite Dr. Gary, our negotiator for the country, to, to share with you the training of today. Let's welcome Dr. Gary. Right. Good evening, everyone. First of all, thank you very much for, for taking a weekend evening to come and attend this. Um, I suppose when I was your age, I had better things to do with this, <laughs> this time of, of night than sit in a room uh, and listen to some government person talk about climate change. But I'm really glad that you made the time. 
Uh, I myself am very happy to be here. As you know, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment uh, tries to engage with NGOs. It's a bit of a uh, shift in the traditional uh, government uh, policy, but uh, especially with respect to the environment, we think that, that uh, there can never be enough ice and ears out there to actually keep track of, of uh, all environmental issues. Um, and to ensure that the government is, is informed at all times. Uh, I think that, that uh, your presence here is a very good sign, and, and I take that very positively. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, well, Malaysia Youth Delegation, uh, Power Shift, Prasatwan Malay Bhubani Klim, and uh, if, if it's still relevant, uh, the MyCGN <laughs> program. <laughs> well, things, things come and go, but uh, you, you, you've got to get the support where you can find it. So, um, uh, suffice to say, uh, uh, I am very pleased to, to help throw some light on, on this issue. It's a very difficult issue if you are not at the negotiations to understand the breadth of what's going on. Uh, and I'm actually very glad that, that you have uh, Professor Tangan on the list because at the last part of my, my presentation, I actually go into uh, some of the non-UNFCCC uh, avenues that are being utilized to try to drive the process. Sometimes to, to good end, sometimes not, not, not so good. But, uh, okay, let's uh, fill up this outline slide. And um, first of all, a little bit of background. Blocking people? Or? Oh, okay. It's okay. All right. I'm blocking the camera a little bit, so maybe I was okay. just turn okay. okay. All right. Um, yeah, a bit of background uh, before we get into this. What, what is the UNFCCC? Where did it come from? Um, uh, you know, who are parties to it, etc. And then uh, moving on to what we're going to be doing in Paris. What this is all about? Why we are having so many meetings this year? Why the time crunch? Uh, is this the first stab we're taking at it? That kind of thing. Um, then I'll get actually in, into what I was asked to talk about here. What are the groupings? How do we? How can we type groupings? Who are the relevant groups? Uh, what are their memberships? And then I will change a little bit and, and talk about um, how uh, being in groups affects uh, the balance of the negotiations. And I will do it through a case study, just looking at, at Australia as an example. All right. Uh, from there, I'll move to uh, what I consider to be the crunch issue throughout all of these negotiations, and that is the issue of differentiation. Uh, we look at how differentiation is uh, codified in the convention, how it's implemented, what are some of the implications of the way differentiation, differentiation is operationalized and implemented, and then uh, try to, to from, from there, try to look at how it would be possible, if it is at all possible, to ensure that this new agreement under the convention, and we'll talk more about it, um, is in accordance with the convention itself, which is it is supposed to be because it is under the convention. So how far can you stretch this rubber band before it either bursts or it just loses all elasticity and it makes no sense. Okay, um, is this at all possible given the messages, the body language, the submissions, the intended nationally determined contributions that have been put out uh, by some of our, our negotiating partners? And then um, finally, uh, a little bit of uh, coverage on some of the non UNFCCC channels that have been employed, are being employed, etc., to, to move this. Um, like to keep this informal as, as far as possible, so if you have questions, if you stop me, uh, we'll move where the discussion takes us. Uh, it's a bit cold and butting. Silk butting is not good for, for cold, but that's okay. It's, it's Thursday and so it's butting day. Um, but okay, let's, let's move ahead then. Um, okay. So, uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, yes, very long name, and, and UNFCCC, you always have to count the C's at the end, some people have <laughs> one too few, one will have one too many, but it's one of the three multilateral environmental agreements, MEAs, MEA multilateral environmental agreement, that came from the Rio Earth Summit in, in 1992. So, 
Um, it was designed from the very outset, together with the other uh, Rio uh, conventions, namely the, the Convention on Desertification, the Convention on Desertification, and also the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, it was intended to incorporate the main principles of uh, the Rio Earth Summit itself. Uh, itself. Uh, has to be science-based, you don't want it based on some wishy-washy ideas or some political ideals, science-based. And then let's be precautionary, let's let's take action before you know we are absolutely certain of what it will be, what will happen because if we wait too long, it's simply going to work. the phase principle, um, often perverted to mean as long as I pay, I can believe. Right? Okay, we know that. So what it actually means is that should I pollute, then I should pay to clean it up. At the very least. All right. So let's not get that wrong. Equity, of course, this, this is sometimes um, translated as fairness, but fairness is very difficult to describe. So let's stick with equity. Um, and uh, common principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. This is a tough one. Um, I know at least one negotiator from Brazil who did his PhD dissertation on CBDI. <laughs> okay, so it's not it's not an easy concept. Okay, essentially it says that this is a global issue because I cannot prevent my emissions from affecting only myself. They come out and they affect people. So everyone has a common responsibility to address it, to deal with it. Okay, but, but because not everyone has contributed to this, to the same degree, there must be some level of differentiation in the response. All right, hence the common responsibility, but the differentiated responsibility. Ah, oh, you shouldn't have, but thank you so very much. Let's <laughs> copy for those who can't see. Anyway, um, all right. So, so, um, uh, in this sense, the, the relatively recent Rio Plus 20 uh, talks are extremely significant because there are those who would maintain that the world has changed since 1992. Rio Plus 10, it already changed a little bit, and now by Rio Plus 20, it has changed a lot. Okay? And they would, uh, they would put forward the idea that because of all these changes, the principles of the original Rio uh, Earth Summit may be slightly re less relevant, or differently relevant than, than uh, what they were when, when, uh, when these principles were uh, invoked 20 years ago to put together uh, the, the Rio Earth Declaration. Okay? But what happened was that Rio Plus 20 leaders actually reaffirmed the principles. Because they agree that as much as has changed, as much remains the same. In fact, some things have gotten worse. They've moved in the wrong direction. They've changed, but they've not changed the way that we wanted them to change. They've changed a whole lot. And so these principles remain relevant and they remain applicable in our time. And, and rather than doing something uh, completely different, reinventing the wheel, what we actually needed to do was to make a wheel that works. We invented a wheel, but for 20 years it hasn't worked. So we have to, to try to find out why it hasn't worked and try to find a solution. This sounds trivial, but it's not. Okay, you see it's extremely difficult. All right, enough about that. So now let's, let's fast forward, fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. Uh, and so now we have this animal, it's sometimes called the 2015 Agreement, sometimes called the Paris Agreement, sometimes called the New Agreement, I've even heard it called the uh, New Universal Agreement, or something like that, which is, you know, wow, New Universal Agreement, sounds very, very grandiose, um, and, and the, the person that used this term is actually someone in the Green Climate Fund, which is very interesting in and of itself, but I'll talk more about that later. Okay. But this new agreement is to be under the convention that's agreed. Okay. Although what people understand from under the convention is subject to, to opinion. It has to be applicable to all. That sounds quite novel. 
But if you think about it, the convention is already applicable to all parties that have signed and ratified the convention. And the Kyoto Protocol is applicable to all who have signed and ratified the Kyoto Protocol, which of course excludes the US. Because they signed it, but they ratified it. And now, I believe Canada, who had withdrawn. Okay? So, applicable to all, you know, as far as we can see, there's nothing new. It's how it's applicable to all that is important. Okay, and I think that, that that's it. Now, if, if all this sounds a trifle familiar, there's very good reason for it. Because um, we actually wanted to strengthen the convention at the point in time when we were bridging from the first commitment period under the Kyoto Protocol to the second commitment period under the Kyoto Protocol. Now, the Kyoto Protocol sounds passe. Okay, people say it's dead. Well, come 2020, it probably will be. But if you recall, the first commitment period for the Kyoto Protocol was 2008 to 2012, and then the second one was 2013 onwards to 2020 or whenever we agreed to it. Alright? But at the end of the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, we realized already all problems. So we said, let's fix these problems. And what came out was the Bali Action Plan. Bali Action Plan was an idea to reintroduce the US into a legally binding compliance system. Because it had set out the first commitment period. And there were people who felt that this was unjust. Not just the developing countries, but developed countries felt that this was unjust. I mean, not the EU. And I had commitments, and I followed through with my commitments. And through the EU burden sharing scheme, some parties actually had to do much more than, than their share to allow for other parties, you know, some of the satellite states and some of the, the, the poorer nations within the EU to actually emit more. Okay. So as a group, yes, they met their targets. You can argue whether the, the targets were ambitious or not, but they met their targets. But some did a lot more than others. Okay. And those who did more looked at the US and said, they're off scot free. They have no commitments, they have no targets. Okay, what, what, what's this about? Alright, so let's be fair. So, the, the, so this situation gave rise then to uh, the establishment of an ad hoc subsidiary body called the Subsidiary Body for Long Term Cooperative Action, LCA, Long Term Cooperative Action. And uh, under the subsidiary body we came up with the Bali Action Plan. The Bali Action Plan was to provide two tracks. One track is the second moving period of the Kyoto Protocol and another track for the US. Oh, not under the convention. Okay, not under the protocol because it could not deal with the protocol. So you said, you make a track for the other convention and you can proceed in the second moving period. Everybody can wrap up their ambitions, yada, 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 and we will finalize this in Copenhagen. Okay? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so, um, Bali Action Plan to conduct a comprehensive process to enable the full, effective, and sustained implementation of the convention. Convention wasn't broken, it just was not fully implemented. Right? So we were going to fix it with the Bali Action Plan. Okay? And yet, when we came to Copenhagen, it did not work at all. Okay? Um, those of you who followed it know that, that because of a small group got together, tried to force an agreement through, you know, Etc. Uh, you know, parties just said, "No, this is this is not what the convention is about. This is not what what Rio was about. What what of all the principles? You know, it, you, here you are saying essentially developing countries were, were made an offer. They said um, the the offer they were made was this: developed countries will reduce their emissions by I think it was eighty percent by some year 2030, 20, something like that. Uh, if the developing countries will do the rest. Okay? And the way the numbers work out, we worked it out, the developing countries would have to cut their already negligible emissions by impossible you know, uh, uh, proportions simply to meet the, the, the remainder. Because if you look at the science, the developed countries actually need to go into the negative, not cut by 80%, go into the negative, to free up some of the space in the buffers. Okay, uh, it is true that developing countries' emissions comprise most of the emissions in the atmosphere now. But it is only true because the buffers have all been filled by the developed countries. Right? So, 
for developing countries to follow anywhere near a similar development trajectory, the buffers need to be empty. And the only way to empty the buffers is for the people who fill the buffers to take their stuff out. All right? So you have to go into negative influence. So we worked all that out and we said, no, no, 80%, no, not, it's not, not possible. India would have to cut by something like 30 to 50%. And India's emissions per capita are already so low. I mean, how much, how, how much more can we ask of that? Okay, people who already have brown house don't have electricity. Those who have electricity have brown house. Okay, what kind of sustainable development is this supposed to happen under the circumstances? Okay, so, um, so after Copenhagen, uh, we had Cancun. Cancun was where we tried to, to, to build trust. Everyone was, you know, everyone was still stinging from Copenhagen. I mean, they, they, nobody trusted me. All right, then we came to Durban. In Durban, we had the Indaba, which I, I still don't understand exactly what it is, but it's some. South African uh, word that means something nice. But anyway, we had the Indaba Agreement and we established a new ad hoc body called the Durban Platform for Enhanced Action. Okay, so how should we enhance, how should we look at this, at this ad hoc body? What is its expressed purpose? Once again, to enhance action. And this action should be in the direction of achieving the objectives of the Convention. So we are talking about enhancing the implementation of the Convention. All right. Fulfilling the ultimate objective of the Convention will require strengthening of the multilateral rules-based regime under the Convention. This is... Yes, sir. Sorry. Um, could you explain what is... Why do you need an ad hoc subsidiary? Okay. Just back track. Okay. Um, in, in the Convention, uh, of course, the supreme body uh, in the con of the Convention is the Conference of the Parties. So the Congress of the Parties um, takes decisions, and these decisions are implemented by COP, but the decisions can also be implemented by either uh, some of the permanent subsidiary bodies or the ad hoc subsidiary bodies. Okay? There are two permanent subsidiary bodies. The two are the SUBSTA, the Subsidiary Body for Scientific and Technological Advice. This is the body that that, uh, it's, it's also made up of, of negotiators, but they deal with issues relating to technical and, and, uh, and scientific issues, which also link up to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. For example, uh, the COP can assign work to the SUBSTA, and the SUBSTA can assign work to the IPCC. Okay. The other government uh, subsidiary body is a subsidiary body for implementation. That body deals with the nuts and bolts about implementing the decisions. Okay. So if, if, if uh, the COP decides uh, that this should happen, then the subsidiary body for, for implementation uh, works out the details of how it should happen and who should do it. Okay. We give it to an NGO, you know, etc. And we can, we can even give it to the IPCC if, if something is needed. Uh, so apart from these permanent subsidiary bodies, the other ad hoc subsidiary bodies, which are called on to uh, achieve a specific task within a specific time period, and after that they might uh, either have their existence prolonged, if they needed to complete the job, or they uh, terminate it. Um, so the subsidiary body for long-term cooperative action terminated in Cancun one year after, uh, after, after the meeting. Um, and we formed now the Durban Platform for Enhanced Action. So, um, in, in the decision, in the preamble, actually there's a section that says, uh, forget what the first way, acknowledging or recalling or whatever, that fulfilling the ultimate objective of the convention will require strengthening the multilateral rules-based regime of the convention. So in other words, our will was not strong enough. Okay, So we need to strengthen the multilateral rules-based regime of the convention to enhance the implementation of the convention. Also, the crux of the decision was to adopt a protocol, another legal instrument, or an agreed outcome with legal force. Nobody knows what the third one is. Uh, under the Convention of Legal to All. And to do it by December of 2015 in Paris. Right? So this is our mandate. We have to do something. Uh, the US has already indicated that a protocol similar to the Kyoto Protocol will not be acceptable to them. Well, what will be? So that's a good question. Forward. Forward. Down. 
Okay, so I'm going to change gears now and talk about uh, groupings within the UNFCCC so that uh, now that we know what we're aiming for in, in December in Paris, let's, let's look a little bit about, about what some of the groupings are within the UNFCCC. The, the first and I think the most important grouping is the grouping that was actually established under the convention, and that is the grouping based on responsibility for historic emissions. And if I were to be completely pedantic about it, I would have to say responsibility for cumulative historic emissions. Why? Because these are the emissions that filled up all the buffers. Okay? It's not as if if I accumulate a debt, then my debt is only the debts I added last year. It's all the debts that I've added. Right? Especially if the money I've taken from the bank is needed by somebody else elsewhere, that cannot happen until I return that. Right? So it's cumulative responsibility. And this is actually um, worked into the convention quite early. In fact, if you look at the convention, the first article is simply definitions. Second article is the objective. The third article is the principles. And these come from the real principles I talked about earlier. Okay? And the fourth article already says commitments. So in other words, for the, the, the UN Convention on Climate Change, you don't wait very long before you get to commitments. Okay? They are right after, right after the principles that govern this convention come the Commitments. It's not obligations, it's not suggestions, it's not aspirations, it's commitments. Everyone has commitments, it's just only what commitments do people do different groups have. So right away, 4.1 says, what are the commi uh, commitments of everyone? Everyone shall. All parties shall. That's 4.1. Immediately after that, Article 4.2 says, Parties included in Annex 1 shall. And Annex 1 contains a list of parties who have the responsibility for historical emissions. Right there is this differentiation. Okay? And then thereafter it goes on to Article 4.3, which talks about finance. And it says, and it says parties included in Annex 2 shall. And Annex 2 parties are a subset of Annex 1 parties, only they are richer. So they not only have a commitment to reduce, excuse me, everyone has a commitment to reduce emissions. If you look at Article 4.1, everyone has a commitment to reduce, to prevent, etc. If you look at Article 4.2, the different word in there is limit. Okay? Everyone has to reduce emissions, etc. But Article 4.2 says, Annex 1 parties have to limit emissions, which means they have a threshold that they cannot pass, unlike everyone. Right? And then when it comes to Article 4.3, that says that, uh, that parties include the Annex 2 have a commitment to finance, provide finance, including for technology transfer, including for capacity building, etc. Right? So right away, in Article 4, the annexes already start differentiating. Okay, and they differentiate on the basis of responsibility. Um, you could think of different ways of, of differentiating. You could look at developed and developing countries. Okay, then you have to draw a line somewhere. <coughs> right? Then you have to think about well, who developed and when, and when is when am I going to achieve developed status? Is it 2020? Do I suddenly change when I go there, etc.? Okay, you can look at political ideologies. Uh, groups, groups that have specific uh, ideologies, they, they can gather together, right? Uh, uh, I guess the Bolivarian uh, uh, countries would be one of those. You could have groups that are literally tied together by region. The Africa group is a group that does function effectively as a region, okay? But it is very diverse. South Africa all the way up to Egypt and Algeria and Morocco and North African states. You've got groups that are united by national circumstances, uh, the association of small island states, it doesn't matter if they're in the Caribbean or in the Pacific, the small island states have similar national circumstances. You could have groups that are united by vulnerability, 
okay, the mountainous and landlocked countries, okay, would be one group that suffer from glacial lake outbursts and all these things. Yes, sir. Um, what would be the difference though for, from national circumstances <coughs> among the refugee-based groups? I mean, it sounds kind of similar. Um, some national circumstances don't imbue vulnerability. Okay, look at Singapore, for example. It's uh, rather wealthy, rather advanced, rather developed, uh, small island state that is a member of the Association of Small Island States. Okay, but is it vulnerable to sea level rise? Not so sure. Okay, it's fairly rocky, you know. Um, it's vulnerable to other impacts of climate change. It doesn't have water. It has to buy water from us. Uh, it doesn't have energy sources. Uh, it has to buy electricity from us to supplement its own generation, etc. So um, these are not these are not uh, not mutually exclusive. I think. Just just so you know. Ah, evening. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. But yeah, no. To answer your question, these are not mutually exclusive. As well. It's just that that uh, groups cluster in different ways. And this is this is giving a bit of background on what what differences there are in groups and and why it is possible sometimes to belong to many many groups. So you see, uh, some people will complain, you know, that, hey, developing countries didn't didn't they already speak through this group? Well, how, how come this country is speaking through this group and this country is speaking through that group? And there's a lot of overlap. Okay? But sometimes it's the only way to counter uh, a message that. Um, for example, is put forward by a very united group, like uh, the Umbrella Group, which is all advanced developed countries, which, which I'll talk about shortly. Right? Now, uh, before I go any further, I think I, I need a disclaimer. It's a bit late for the disclaimer, but never mind. It's a disclaimer. Am I biased about climate change uh, in the convention? Yes, I'm biased. <laughs> Not because I'm a government servant for this country, but I'm biased because I do believe that uh, that the convention is indeed science-based, okay? And because it is science-based, I think it should be implemented in a science-based manner, all right? Uh, and and, um, and uh, because of all the principles uh, that have been agreed and, and uh, it should be applied, particularly uh, equity and common beneficiary responsibilities, I think that, that uh, there are uh, certain principles that, that should be adhered to, should, should at least be aspired to, rather than simply given up on. Okay? And so for that reason, uh, if, if you were to hear the same talk from someone in a different country, maybe an advanced country, you know, uh, OECD country, it might sound quite different. And I'll, I'll, I'm very frank about that. Okay? So, so uh, we're talking about different groups in the UNFCCC system, and this is how they cluster. This is not a, a, a mutually exclusive list; it can belong to more than one. So uh, some of the Pacific small island states call at all vulnerable to sea level rise, storms, etc. Um, I mean, you can ask yourself, why isn't the Philippines its own small island association of small island developing states? You know, one country, it's got more islands than all, all the islands put together in the Caribbean, etc. So, uh, you know, interesting questions like that. There can also be issue opposition uh, based groups. There are some groups that, that are like this. Um, and so they, they tend to be spread uh, throughout, throughout the world. Okay? Um, and, uh, uh, and some groups, uh, some countries actually have trouble finding groups. Okay, um, so uh, you have you have uh, the group of seventy-seven in China, which is the largest group, all right? And this is a group of developing countries, non-OECD, except for one, a country called Chile. And G seventy-seven has very magnanimously allowed Chile to remain in the group of seventy-seven in China, even though. Most developing countries, should they graduate and become OECD countries, would tend to leave and join an uh, you know, OECD group. And, and I'll talk about one in the video. But most of the members of the, of the other groups that I'll talk about, and there are sub, subgroups of the group of 77 in China, 
uh, and they're grouped together for specific issues or specific reasons. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, they belong to G77. There's one very interesting case, though, Vanuatu. <coughs> Vanuatu is not a member of the group of 77 in China. I'm oh, sorry, I'm sorry, not Vanuatu. I'm sorry, Tuvalu, Tuvalu. Tuvalu is not a member of the G77 in China, but is welcome at all the meetings. Why? Because the coordinator of that group of countries is the coordinator of the least developed countries. And most of the least developed countries are in the G77 in China. Okay? So Tuvalu, even though it's not a member of the G77 in China, is considered at least an honorary member by virtue of the fact that the person who coordinates for the least developed countries represents Tuvalu. Okay? So, under the group of 77 in China, one of the most united groups is Africa group. It's also one of the most diverse groups. It contains a very, very, uh, uh, well, I won't say well-to-do or affluent countries, but these countries that produce oil like Nigeria, etc. It also has countries that are extremely destitute. All right? But the African group is a very strong group because they kind of have um, they kind of have the moral high ground on a lot of issues. All right? Many of them are francophone, so English is not the first language. Uh, they may be at a disadvantage when it comes to negotiation, etc. Even though French is one of the UN languages, okay? only the uh, plenaries and uh, the, the uh, formal contact groups are uh, translated. Once you get into informal groups, whether it's uh, informal uh, spin-off groups, etc., there's no translation. And all the documents are primarily in English. Until they get close to uh, being decided on at which point in time they're translated into the UN language system. Alright, so they're, they're strong. Sure, but if you if you move with the African group and you're sensitive to the African group, you can actually go very far. There's the uh, association of the, the Bolivarian uh, Latin American countries. This is a very strong group uh, because they are <laughs> you know they are a solidarity uh, you know labor kind of socialist group. Okay, it started off with, with just uh, Venezuela and Cuba. Okay, because they said, okay, we'll give you oil, you give us doctors. All right, and then it expanded to Bolivia and a whole number of other states, including Nicaragua. Right? There are the Association of Independent Latin American and Caribbean Countries. This group includes Chile, Chile, Peru, uh, Costa Rica, Guatemala, etc., etc. Seen as a, once again, it contains a number of countries that have been courted by the OECD and very close Colombia and Costa Rica are in almost, almost at the OECD level. Right? The group is seen as being very sympathetic to US and North American causes. Very much in that. Um, what's the word? Progressive. Progressive. Okay. Uh, Arab group okay, uh, moves a lot as far as Iran. No, Iraq. Iran. Iran is not out of the Arab group. Iran is a Parsi. The four big boys in G77 in China, the basic Brazil, uh, South Africa, uh, India, and China, used to be a group called um, the BRICS, but Russia and all that uh, had different interests. So these are the four big boys in G77 in China and the Association of Small Island States. Very diverse. Once again, very affluent states, Singapore, Barbados, okay, all the way to uh, some extremely destitute uh, states. And then the least developed countries. So, can you be a member of the least developed country, uh, a member of EOSIS, and a member of G77 in China? Yes, it's completely possible. All right? But for other groups, for other countries, essentially they only have G77 in China as a group to uh, form a coalition with. And Malaysia was actually in that category not too long ago. Why? Because Malaysia is part of the Asian group, and the Asian group is a dysfunctional group because it has in it, within its membership, Japan, who is a member of the Umbrella Group, and Korea, South Korea, who is a member of the Environmental Integrity Group, is an OECD group. Alright? So the, the Asian group is dysfunctional. So until this group came along called the like-minded developing countries. 
Like many developed countries, total somewhere between 22, 25, uh, sometimes as much as 30 countries. But they're distributed pretty much worldwide. They're all developing countries. And they have, um, and I, I'd be stretched to say what individual issue they glom onto, but essentially, uh, if I had to, to place it, to put it most simply, they're the group that's defending the convention. Okay, now among the developed countries, there are EU, obviously, very great. I talked about them a bit earlier. The umbrella group, which is uh, the non EU developed countries. So, we, what we're talking about is we're talking the US, Canada, Russia, uh, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, um, interestingly, Norway, um, interestingly, also, I think, Iceland. Okay, so a mixed group. Good boys and bad boys in this group. Uh, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be gender specific. <laughs> and I shouldn't even be, be making judgment calls. Anyway, I said I was biased. Okay, um, the Environmental Integrity Group, which is an OECD group, okay, has Switzerland, and also has Mexico, uh, South Korea, Liechtenstein, Monaco, okay. But it's a group that, that can afford to have developing uh, uh, country, uh, champion developing country issues as well as, you know, as well as environmental integrity issues. So, so they can push on both sides. How, does, how do they come together? What's the environmental integrity? Um, simply that. They, they, you know, they, they push the rhetoric that says that, okay, you know, uh, we are for constantly pushing the bar up. Right? Uh, some countries have, in the group have more trouble with it than others. Okay? Uh, you know, if you think of South Korea, extremely industrialized, but still has a lot of air quality problems. Okay, still has some social labor issues to deal with, permanent jobs, such as. So I mean, uh, different challenges all around. Um, to be fair to Switzerland, it is an Annex One party. All right. But it is a very rare Annex One party because it actually is, I think, the only Annex One party that doesn't have the responsibility for historical regions. Because simply as a country, they have always had hydroelectric power. And even now, when they have huge power needs, they simply buy low carbon electricity from the French. Okay? So, you know, there are some countries that have managed to make this jump from developing to developed countries without incurring a carbon debt. Right? Would I like Malaysia to be like that? Of course, in a heartbeat. I would love for Malaysia to get from developing to developed status without ever becoming an X1. Ever. French low carbon energy is used almost all from nuclear power. Yes, energy. nuclear. It is so that's recognized as low carbon. No, they, they they just buy it, okay? And and the the uh, emissions that are ascribed to it are minimal. I'm not saying that they're not that. Because you still need to process the uranium ore, you still need to refine it, you still I mean, you need to dispose of all the stuff. In there. So this is a carbon footprint. It's just nowhere near as high as coal, which Poland and Germany, some parts of Germany use in great abundance. Right? And this is a problem. Right? So, um, and then and then there are quote unquote very interesting groups like the Katehena group, or the Katehena Dialogue for Progressive Action. And this is a group that was kind of put together by the ILAC, which are the, uh, the independent Latin American states, together with as many developing countries as they could pull together, and they touted this as the only developed slash developing country group. Okay? So this group has a bit of a moral high ground in the sense that, well, we are the people that are trying to bridge the divide between Annex 1 and non-Annex 1. Okay? And we are the group that's going to, to be the solution to this problem. Right? So immediately Indonesia and a number of other countries join. And, and, uh, and uh, it has come up with very interesting statements. Okay, but it's been interesting because they, they cannot actually contradict G77 and China statements because members are members of G77 and China. You know, but at the same time they cannot stray too far away from the ILAC statements and you know as well. So it's just kind of interesting. So, uh, all right. So, these are these are the groups, and, and 
how they fall vis-a-vis -vis the types of groupings you can kind of see. Okay, uh, there's some geographic uh, basis for some of these groups. Of course, the Ilac and the Alba, uh, Central American, Caribbean, South America. Uh, the Arab group is clearly Arab. African group is clearly African. You know. And then the, the, the LDCs are situational, variability, etc. EOCs as well. And then the LMDCs, interestingly, have members of EOCs in them. Uh, they have members of the LDCs in them. They have members of the Africa group, the Arab group in them. And they are all G77. Okay? Yes? Um, just to further clarify, I mean, just to ask clarification what you mentioned earlier. Like, for example, the Katayana dialogue. Or progressive action, they're also part of ILAC, and I mean, they've, they've also got, they can't, whatever they say, they can't really contradict the statements of like the G77 in China and ILAC. So, what exactly do they champion? Are they specific? What, you know, yeah, they, what, what, what they champion is, is um, what they champion is the elusive center, the elusive solution space. Okay? For the 2015 agreement to work, there must be a solution space. There must be a solution. I mean, it's mathematics, if you think about it. If there's no space for a solution, there will be no solution. Okay? If the solution is undefined, there's no space for it. There must be a solution space. Okay? But that solution space has to be bound by a number of very specific criteria. Right? And where do those where, where do we derive those criteria? For us, we derive those criteria from the convention. Because you said in this agreement, you agree that this new agreement is under the convention. Well, if it's under the convention, then it should be at the very least guided by its principles and provisions. Okay? So the question is then, how far or what can you pull from the convention to establish the bounds for this new and, and depending on what people are saying are possible landing zones, are these landing zones within or without the space? Within or outside the space? Those are very interesting questions. Uh, yes, Amon, please. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, so. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, we have many relevant groups. So, do they make the process more complicated or the negotiation process, or what exactly they play in comparison with the main groups. That you okay, they, 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 they make the negotiation more complicated, but they also make the, the negotiation more interesting. And they can sometimes make the negotiation more rewarding as well. Because um, let's, say that, um, let's say that within the group of 77 in China, there are actually many areas, believe it or not, 130 something odd countries. Okay? 130 something odd countries. But they actually have united positions on most of the key issues in the First, they have a united position on adaptation. Right? Adaptation is an imposition on developing countries because they did not cause climate change, but they are impacted by climate change. And they have no choice. Okay? If I'm going to have more intense rainfall, I need to, to beef up my flood control measures. If I'm going to have droughts, I need to spend money on reservoirs. If I'm going to have extreme weather events, I mean, you know, if I have loss and damage, I have to rebuild. I can't just leave it like that. Right? Because I've also signed the UN Declaration on Sustainable Development. Okay. So I've got to develop sustainably and I can't you know, develop sustainably when I've got lots of damage. So it's an imposition for developing countries. And so by virtue of that, by virtue of that, that it is a commitment for developed countries for Annex 1, in fact, specifically for Annex 2 countries, to provide finance to support adaptation measures for developing countries. Okay? So um, when, when, when we look at, at how the G77 come together? They come together on adaptation, they come together on finance, they agree on technology transfer, they agree on capacity building. Okay? They are finding agreement right now in the area of what has been called transparency, but what we call measurement, reporting, and verification. Measurement, reporting, and verification of actions, 
Because that's what developed countries are. They will be giving you money. You want to see what's happening to our money. So we said, okay, fine. We agreed to build it under Bali Action Plan. But, but, there are times when what we say, what we calculate that you've given us is not the same as what you say you're giving us. So there must be measurement, reporting, and verification of support. Okay, and they go hand in hand. And better yet, if you can tell us ahead of time how much support you might be able to provide for adaptation, then we will actually plan our mitigation actions and adaptation measures accordingly. Alright? So there is a link. There is a link. It's a functional link. It's not a political link. It's a functional link between support and the means of implementation. You want to implement mitigation? Yes. That's the technologies that are relevant. Financing that's relevant. Okay? Um, so, uh, yeah, so these groupings can actually enrich and, and help help support. So the, you, the chair of G77 in China says this is our statement and Arab group pipes up and says we support that statement. You know, this group pipes up and says so. And they support each other's statements. Okay, it's also enriching and it, it helps level the playing field because the 32 EU countries speak once. They say I speak for 32 countries. It is the kind of but um, you know, but it's seldom that the G77 team I speak for 100, you know, uh, it doesn't have the same effect. The number gets too big after a while. But the 32 countries have a lot of clout. So, um, yeah, I hope I hope that so so it's there's groups within groups, and it's not always easy. The, the groups have have their their pet ideas. They interest, I mean, for 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 the oil producing countries, not all Arab countries are oil producing. Oil producing countries. They need to diversify because there are adverse impacts of response measures. If we say that, that, that we're going to go away from fossil fuels, that means that these countries whose only source of income is fossil fuels need to diversify into something else. Otherwise, their survival is too big. Okay. Or they need technologies that convert fossil fuels to hydrogen, for example. Then there won't be an impact for using fossil fuels, for example. Okay? So, um, yeah. And then at the same time, you know, the, the association of other states is saying, what are you worried about? It's like, we are drowning. Okay? So it's not, not always easy to bring the G77 together and China together, but we do. We do, and, and, and when the G77 and China is together, yes, it is a force to be reckoned with. But as, I, as you will see when we come to the end, is this force strong enough to withstand the challenge to the convention that has been mounted? Okay? All right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, um, I, out of those, like all the subgroup under G77, is yeah. there any group that is like driving the direction of the negotiation? Uh, very good question. Very good question. Because, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, uh, and others might be following this. I may be biased again. I'm being biased because I'm speaking from Malaysia and Malaysia. Doesn't have any group in the G77 apart from the like-minded developing countries. Okay, ASEAN is not a recognized group under the UNFCCC. Um, but Malaysia is a part of the, the LMDC. The LMDC existed before Cancun and Durban, but it really came together after Durban. Okay, in Cancun, which was before Durban, Bolivia was the only country saying we disagree with this decision. It does not live up to, but they were steamrolled. The other developing countries stood by, couldn't do anything. In Durban, when the LCA was on the chopping block, Malaysia was the only country that said, we do not agree to adopt the end of the LCA as we know it. We think the document is, is unbalanced. And everyone had said that before the Indaba came along. Everyone said, oh, the document is unbalanced. And we said, yes. Um, so Malaysia said, we, we are not prepared to adopt it. But the South African uh, presidency, who once again had a vested interest in ensuring that COP was successful in South Africa, adopted all this. Okay? Shortly after that, we said, you know, the end game is killing us. The end game is killing us because the G77 breaks up in the end game and there's no one to champion it. And one country, if one country is trying to hold it, they will get steamrolled. So the like-minded developing countries said, we need to 
stop the huddles, because the huddles are not inclusive, only the front few people get to talk, everyone else is doing this. We need to say, no, time out, reboot. Alright, it's that simple. And for, try to find a G77 decision. If these are your, your requests, let's find a G77. And then you, you talk to G77. You don't talk to a few people that are Okay? And, and if it's acceptable to you and what filters out, and suddenly you've adopted the decision. Alright? So the LMDC got together, like I said, it's about 20 something odd countries, and they said, no, no country will left, be left standing on in fact, that's the mantra of G77 now. Do no harm. In other words, no G77 in China country should hold a position that harms another G77 in China country. And leave no one behind. Okay? So between do no harm and leave no one behind, hopefully G77 can try to band together on the remainder of the issues uh, for which they have uh, differences, specifically the issue of mitigation. It's very hard because the developed countries have succeeded in convincing some developing countries that other developing countries are their worst enemies. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so, so, I mean, and it's, it's easy to do, I mean, you know, so, uh, especially if you are in debt to the World Bank, <laughs> you know, multilateral development funds, and, you know, you just, you have to worry about whether or not the, the aid comes through next year, otherwise your country is bankrupt. I mean, think about it, there's some, there's some countries in that situation. Okay, I'm going to change gears now. Yes, sir. You mentioned ASEAN is not a recognized group. No, it's not a recognized group. Would it benefit the ASEAN region if it can become a recognized group? Um, and would that be actually a I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and, and say no, simply because ASEAN, uh, with 10 countries, is as diverse as the G77 in China with 133 countries. So the coefficient of, of of uh, what's the word? Of the coefficient of diversity. Diversity is much, much higher in, in the G in the in ASEAN is you've got Singapore which is practically OECD and you've got the three least developed countries, you know, and India and Myanmar. Right? So our our yeah, we are extremely diverse. We are as diverse as you think China. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's little mileage to make there. There are other anecdotes that we tell you, but, but uh, another time, because um, I need to get through it. So I'm now going to, I'm not supposed to go into this, this case study with Australia. Okay, uh, once again, because Australia is a member of the uh, umbrella group, it's a developed country. Okay. And uh, the question is, um, what would be an emission reduction that's fair for Australia? Okay. Australia comes out and says, we have... 1.5% currently, we have currently, we have 1.5% of the world's emission. It's negligible, 1.5% of the world's emission. There's no right? There's no right? You're supposed to answer, yes. 1.5%, <laughs> okay? Alright, so you think about it, okay, now there are about 200 countries in the world, so about the average emission should be about half a percent, right? So 1.5 percent is actually just on that very gross level. It's about three times what you should be emitting. Okay, and that's just that's that's the easiest calculation. Okay, and uh, sorry. What about the land mass? Well. Yeah, yeah, and and, um, and 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 how long it's been, yeah, etc. So, so uh, let, let's move into that, that slide a little bit. Okay, so this is historic cumulative emissions by country. Okay, this is the cumulative emissions. This is the beginning of the, the industrial revolution. We start to pull coal out of the ground, burn it. Make lots of money, colonize other countries, you know, take the rubber, uh, or tin, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so so you know we've got oh sorry, the, the number numbering here is in the black. It's, it's one through thirteen down here. Yeah. Okay, and then fourteen, fifteen up to twenty-five. Okay? And if you look at this, you will see, wait a minute, there's some developing countries in there. Right? Right, we've got China there, yes, China there, we've got India there, 
South Africa, Mexico, Mexico is OECD. Okay, Korea is OECD. Okay, but we've got Brazil there. Remember, BRIC, one of the four big boys in the, in the group of Central China, China. Iran. Very old civilization, right? Saudi Arabia, will be petroleum producers, Indonesia, etc. Now, yes, cumulatively, they have, they are responsible for a lot of emissions, okay? Petrol is cheaper than water in some of these countries. And then Argentina, you know, once again, uh, is it Spain's fault? <laughs> is it Argentina's fault? I'm not sure. Okay? Are Malaysia's emissions prior to 1957? Whose emissions are they, you know? That kind of thing. Anyway. But, but uh, then Australia is 14. There. Okay? So, 200 countries. Then, if you look at it, per capita, it's even more interesting. Now, this is <coughs> emissions per capita. So, of course, the small states are going to jump to the top, and the big states are going to jump to the bottom in terms of population. So, Far, far fewer developing countries here. Right? Uh, India and China have dropped up. Okay? And this is what it looks like. Um, so, very interesting. UAE, very, very small. Okay? A bit unfair. Right? But, but they're there. Singapore, getting up there. Okay? It's been a trade center for a long time. It's part of its wealth, etc. Once again, it's already really quick. Quick, also very small. Right? So, um, perhaps we don't have to go to this level per capita, but at least cumulative emissions since the beginning makes sense because it is filled up the buffers. Every gram of CO2 I emit now cannot go into a buffer. Cannot. Buffers are full. That's why. That's why it's staying in the atmosphere. Right? And the, the true crunch issue, if you were to boil it all down, is it still comes back to differentiation. How differentiation is attributed and how it is implemented and what differences are ascribed to countries in terms of responsibility for this. Alright? And um, if you think about several issues, uh, ways that have been tried, of course there's the annexes, we talked about that. But like I said, you can also differentiate along develop, developing lines that can be difficult. You can say the rich countries should do more. So one of the phrases that has come out in the negotiations is, and countries in a position to do so. See? Countries included in Annex 2, and countries in a position to do so shall provide financing. Okay. So the big question is, who decides who is in a position to do so? Is it the country that decides? Okay, because if we allow countries to decide, then no country will do it. What is the next one? I don't know. Do you have the next one? I don't know. You know, I just had a big storm. Okay, <laughs> resilient versus vulnerable. I've got lots of assets, and the bank is, is bursting. If I get New Orleans wiped out, I can rebuild it. If Sandy comes, I can rebuild it. It's all insured. Not only can I rebuild it, I get new stuff. Okay? I had a 21-inch CRT TV, I can now get a flat. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. so, when uh, you say resilient versus vulnerable, um, how do you define this resilient? In terms of uh, financially resilient? Or okay. this, is, of, this, is, this is not an exact opposite. I mean, well aware of this, not unlike, unlike rich versus poor. Okay, uh, resiliency, uh, resilience. There's no such word to resiliency. Resilience can be understood in a number of different ways. Uh, one can actually, uh, at one end of the spectrum, you can, might actually say they're climate secure. Okay, in other words, they've done their adaptation, their sea walls are high enough, you know, their res res emergency response measures are well equipped, etc. Et um, and then, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, you have vulnerability is a function of, of exposure, right? Uh, and there, there are just countries that are much more exposed than others. Um, Philippines, for example, okay, storm tracks used to be further north in Taiwan, now they track further south more often, 
right? And uh, here's a country that's that actually has a mayor of town that actually made all preparations, had a hardened building, etc. Stopped water spies, and I think that when uh, Haiyan came, there was only one survivor in Met, and, and the entire preparations to deal with the disaster were gone. So fact remains, there will be some extreme weather events that cannot be uh, prepared for, that cannot be uh, adapted to. You just have to take the loss and damage and go from there. Okay. So when loss and damage happens, you can be like the US. My beach house was insured. Spill it again. Or you can be like the Philippines. Three years later, four years later, five years later, still people are getting tents. So, where's the equity? How do we do this? Okay. Um, responsible, this is not responsible, this is the, the, the uh, NX1 and NX1. Binary versus non binary. All the previous cases are binary. Right? You have to draw the line somewhere. Right? But can you have a hybrid system where, where some. <laughs> Okay, fine. Stuffy. More stuffy than one. Um, yeah, but can some aspects of this be variable or can, can be non binary, can be progressive in some kind? Possibly. Let's talk about it. Self differentiated is very interesting. <laughs> when you see self differentiated, think non differentiated. Okay, everybody does what they want. Alright, and I say it's my best. I'll say it's my best. If you want me to increase any complain, I might increase a little bit. But, you know, I'm still going to, in fact, I'm going to under, I'm going to uh, under, uh, um, what's, the, what's the word? Uh, uh, I'm going to under pledge so that when you complain, and I know you will, I can up it. Okay? So let's be frank about it. Self differentiation is no differentiation. Okay. Did I already see this slide? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, maybe I pasted it in my accident. Okay. So let's look at, at how some of this differentiation manifests itself under the convention. Okay. For adaptation, as I said, for developing countries, it's an imposition. We adapt to the extent that we can, given the resources that we have. Why? Because we still have other commitments. We are committed to sustainable development, okay? But regardless, when we are faced with changing weather patterns, we have to build more flood structures. We have to build more dams to store water. We have to put in irrigation, we have to build tube wells and check dams to prevent peatlands from drying out and to put out the fires when they occur. Right? It's worth it. It pays off. It has. Right? But for the developed countries, it's a finance commitment. And it's a finance commitment under Article 4.23, 4.23. For mitigation, for developing countries, mitigation is an enabled aspiration. No country wants to have poor air quality, right? We wish it were all electric cars out here, so you wouldn't have to breathe any exhaust. We wish those electric cars were run with low emissions electricity from power plants, right? It's a slippery point, really. We won't, go, we won't go to that today yet, but, but you know, it, it could be hydroelectric, it could be, could be some other, it could be biomass, you know, it could be renewable, some, some renewable source. Okay? Because some people say nuclear is not entirely fun. Um, Alright? But for, uh, for, for NX1 countries, it's finance as well as an action commitment. Okay? Under Article 4.2, of the convention, they are required to limit emissions. Limit. This word is not used in 4.1. Okay, 4.1 says all parties have to reduce, control, prevent. Okay, but in addition, Article 4.2 says Annex 1 countries 
in addition to all these commitments in 4.1, they have to limit. Okay, which means there's a threshold, you can't pass it. But uh, they have a, uh, if you are annex 2, then you have a commitment to provide finance. Finance is a need for developing countries, but it's a commitment for annex 2 parties. And annex 2 comes in immediately after Article 4. Point, yeah, it comes in right at 4.3, which is finance. So 4.1, everyone's commitments, 4.2, annex 1 parties' commitments, 4.3, annex 2 parties' commitments to finance. Yes? Yeah, um, when you talk about uh, financing from the annex 2 countries, um, yeah. how do they pool the resources and how do they distribute the resources to the... Uh, okay, uh, that's also another uh, very big story. Uh, climate finance, if, if you were to ask for a definition, then a whole number of criteria, it should be new, which means it, it, it should not be any money that's currently being pledged. It should be additional, which means it cannot be something that it must be predictable, it must be adequate, it must be... So you can ascribe all these adjectives to climate finance, right? But still you find that people are calling climate finance, you know, calling ODA climate finance, they're calling uh, education, you know, uh, contribution climate finance. They're calling, now they're calling loans and investments climate finance. Yeah, no, just, just read, read any of the, the documents coming out from the Green Climate Fund now. Okay, what was supposed to be a fund to enable developed countries to meet their obligations to provide finance for adaptation and mitigation measures to developing countries has become a UN bank that uses developed country funds to help the poorest countries. So they, they keep shrinking the recipient pool, okay, and they keep expanding their claim over the resources. No money. Wait a minute. You're a party to the to the to the convention. It's your obligation. We are not asking for charity. You have an obligation, you have a climate debt that you need to repay to us. Okay, that's not Malaysia, but you know, some of the, some of the, the countries that are perhaps more impacted by extreme weather than India, right? Uh, technology and capacity building the same. It's a need for developed countries, and there's a need for adaptation measures as well as for mitigation. The more you adapt, the less you need to mitigate the future. The more you mitigate, the less you need to adapt the future. Okay, but the technology works all around. Now this MRB is what I talked about earlier. You will hear it called transparency. This is a new word. You don't know what transparency means, apart from like, water or glass. But it's measurement, reporting, and verification. Okay? And under the Bali Action Plan, developing countries were supposed to implement nationally appropriate mitigation actions on NAMAS. You shouldn't forget this because it's a nice video with NAMAS. Okay? <laughs> nationally appropriate mitigation actions in the context of measure, measure, uh, uh, and reported verified actions. So your NAMAS should be MRV'd. But you should also MRV the support that you receive to implement your national appropriate mitigation actions. Right? And then, so the, the, the measurement, reporting, and verification of actions goes hand in hand with the support. And like I said, if you know the support earlier, you can do the actions better. Okay? So, now we come to the crunch. How can this setup, which is a setup under the convention, as it is now, this convention, okay, how can this be strengthened to enhance the implementation of the convention? Okay. If you look at what's being proposed, it's very interesting. For adaptation, the African group has said, well, there should be a global goal for adaptation. And immediately some countries say, no, 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 really. Developing countries say, no, no, no. We are, we are fin financing adaptation to the extent that we can. Okay? You can't, you can't tell us that we must adapt. Okay? And so the developed countries didn't have to say, they just kept on here. <laughs> no? Developing countries said, no, no, no. Then, then the African group clarified, no, 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 no. The global goal for adaptation is a support goal which means that adaptation needs 
as outlined in countries' national adaptation plans, need to be supported. Okay? So in other words, if Malaysia put together a national adaptation plan, says we need 9 billion US dollars between this year and this year to implement all these measures to ensure that the country is protected against this and this and this and this, then that target should be provided by developed countries. Oh, then they will write, well, you know, all these things you need to go to Congress and you need to EU, <laughs> Parliament, and you know, no go. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 how, so how do we strengthen the multilateral Mitigation. Yes, in fact, developed countries have strongly put forward the idea that the treaty agreement should only have mitigation, only mitigation targets. Right? But how do we ensure that what we put there as our targets through our intended nationally determined contributions are going to be able to be implemented? Where are the means of implementation? So we're saying that there's a link. Okay, you enable our aspiration through finance, through technology transfer. Okay? If we have fuel cell technology, we could be much more efficient. If we have hybrid vehicle technology, we could be much more efficient. Why don't we have hybrid buses? They are go and stop. They are recharged, you know, they, they, they can... Uh, uh, there's output of energy, there's retrieval of energy. Every time you break the bus, you recharge that. It's that kind of thing, right? Uh, and same all the way. So, the, the challenge really now is to, to how can we enhance implementation of convention, strengthen the multilateral rules-based regime without watering down any of these? And, and as I said, the body language, the textual proposals, everything that we've been hearing from developed countries essentially waters this down. When we were talking about what goes into intended nationally determined contributions, we agreed that mitigation would be part of a intended nationally determined contribution, which means this is the raw number that's going to go into the treaty. Somehow it's going to be converted into a legally binding pledge in the post-2020 period. Alright? So, what did we expect? We expected that developed countries, Annex 1 countries, Annex 2 countries, would put mitigation targets in their INDCs, but we also expected that they would meet other obligations under the convention, which means they would put finance, technology transfer, capacity building in there as well. Today, no country has. Nothing. Okay? So the contribution is only mitigation contribution. And yet, they expect developing countries to put mitigation commitments there without requisite means of implementation. So this is the challenge. The US is unlikely to accept anything other than bottom-up pledge and review. In other words, they will accept even a protocol if the protocol says that your commitment is only to make a pledge, which you say you're going to mitigate, okay, and to agree to that pledge being reviewed, either midway or at the end or whatever. But there's no compliance mechanism. No one can compel you to do anything or take any action against you if you exceed your target, if you hit your target, if you miss your target, no one can. So that can, that can be legally binding. Yeah, 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 yeah. Legally binding, no problem for us. We have no problem with legally binding, not even a protocol. But it says what has to be legally binding. You have to submit a report. Ah, done. I only have to try to implement it to the extent that I achieve it as a thing. That's my obligation. Then, after the fact, a, a posteriori, whatever, you can look at. Not happy? You want to cook, you know? Is it? Okay? Or you can actually settle for something stronger if we have the ambition and the appetite for it. Okay? But this is an issue. Where does that leave us ultimately? You know, there are countries that are talking tough. Developing countries, developed countries that are talking tough. We need this. If we don't have something that will compel countries to reduce emissions, compel countries to provide finance to assist other countries to reduce emissions, compel countries to transfer technology, etc., countries are going to disappear. Tuvalu is going to disappear. Vanuatu is going to disappear. Kiribati. Uh, all going to disappear. Okay? Um, I think somebody said uh, 60 meters. Uh, 60 meters, KL may disappear. But once again, you know, it, it's, it's bad. So, 
you know, are we in a situation to leave any country out? Because we agree that this trade union agreement is going to be different and that it's going to be inclusive, comprehensive, take everyone in, leave no one in. Right? At the same time, to do that, what will we have to give up? How much will we have to allow the multilateral rules-based regime not only to, to maintain its presence, but to be watered down. We're supposed to be enhancing. We're supposed to be strengthening, reinforcing. Instead, we are being asked to water it down in an effort to be inclusive. It's a very, very tough choice. Okay, I'm not sure it's a choice I would want to have to make. I'll be very frank with you about that. Okay? Most importantly, it ignores what is called for by the science. Right? Um, and I'll stop here for a second, take a question. Um, you mentioned about watching down whether to be enforced. Does this go against what was initially established? Like you mentioned earlier about the Rio 20, you know, uh, Rio conference, uh, conference in 92, and how things have been further strengthened in the coming conferences. But will this current agreement sort of go against those principles? Or are they. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the real twenty principles. We, we, we tried to. I think. I think the. I think the convention really did a very thorough job. Very very thorough job. A very finely balanced job. Okay, to 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 find consensus. Okay, the the, the convention is, is a consensus body, and to find consensus. For such a, a far-reaching convention, is very rare. Okay, uh, you may get it by vote, you may get it, by, but by consensus, is very, very hard. Right, but the the, the challenge really is is uh, once again, how far can you stretch it before before it, it, it breaks, before you accept something that is is incongruent, uh, you know. Uh, uh, and, and uh, not in accordance with the convention. How do you accept it as being under the convention? Can you accept it? Are we are we being asked to to achieve the possible? Yeah, given guide. given the parties. Are there certain guidelines for this? Right. Um. See, when 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 it, when it, now this is this is the weird thing about consensus. It really comes down to what everyone can tolerate. Okay. The consensus usually means everyone is equally unhappy. But the question is, you know, uh, everyone can say they are happy. I've never heard the developed countries uh, look at a text and say, you know, I'm really happy with this text. <laughs> okay? Um, when, when we had the uh, co-chairs text in Lima, just last year, okay, the developed countries said, you know, this text is problematic for us. But we're willing to accept it. Okay? Uh, and, and you know, it doesn't do everything we want, but we're willing to accept it. And without exception, G77 of China says, no way, we cannot accept this text. We cannot. I'm sorry, co chairs, we cannot accept this text. And the text had to be given from the co chairs to the Peruvian presidency. And uh, two days later, the Peruvian presidency came back with the text. Then, of course, once again, the developed countries say, oh, we really can't, you know, but we're willing to accept it. <laughs> and this time, the developed countries, because of significant changes to it, were able to accept, in spite of the fact that it um, lost out on one of the key uh, areas that G77 and China was, was sensitive about, and that was loss and damage. Because we agreed to support these developed countries on loss and damage. But we could not we had no precedent uh, in terms of a Greek text to solve the issue of loss and damage. We only managed to save the verbatim reference to common but differentiated responsibilities by virtue of the fact that the US had allowed that into a joint US-China statement. Okay? So we leveraged on that. So wait a minute, US, you agree with China? Okay, in your joint statement that uh, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and, and uh, be guided by uh, 
the principles of the convention, we need to keep them. And, the, and we put it in, make sure they got it. That had actually been out for two courts. CBDR was actually out of the decision for two courts. But only because, you know, of this quote unquote coup that China's calling the US, to getting that language in, we were able to pull that language back. Okay, and because of that, G77 and China had a common position, a strong position in place. But we could not save loss and damage but for a reference in the preamble. In the preamble, there was a small reference on the Warsaw mechanism for loss and damage. But we couldn't put it in the uh, operative text decision. Okay, so um, it's, uh, it's an issue where seriously no water is ever given. Ever. And every, every step we take, okay, um, the Annex 1 party's uh, job is to make it harder to, for you to take that step. Uh, so everything must be earned. As a matter of fact, it's very, very interesting, uh, I think, uh, EnviroWiki. EnviroWiki has, has a very interesting definition for, for the umbrella group. And I, I suggest you go and look it up. <laughs> okay. It's not very long, you know, as wikis go. In fact, it's very, very short. But but uh, but it, 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 it's uh, quite interesting. Anyway, uh, these are problems. If we if we literally cave and allow something that, that uh, is going to be simply a free for all, what everyone wants, bottom up, you know, you'll hear these terms. Top down is of course Kyoto Protocol, etc. Bottom up is you know, to some extent or to some degree people do more or less what they think they can. Then we are looking at possibly a four plus degree. And then if we find ourselves in a four plus degree world, can <coughs> we seriously expect our developing country partners to put them to pay for it? Can we? Huh? Huh? Now, Malaysia does play a fairly active role in the negotiation. Uh, I happen to help coordinate the Group of 77 of China on the ADP, which means that I actually uh, have uh, thematic coordinators working on adaptation, loss and damage, mitigation, and so within the G77, working to build consensus. Working. Um, another member of our delegation, uh, Mr. Bujiao uh, Nija, uh, happens to be the spokesperson for the like-minded so you'll see his picture a lot, a lot. Uh, LMDC speaks a lot, so he speaks a lot. So he's a picture. <laughs> but, uh, um, but Malaysia is, is, is really trying to, with the help of the LMDC, strengthen the key pillars under the convention. Now seriously, if you are faced with an agreement that essentially drowns the Small island developing states, or you know, ensures a uh, job for sub Saharan states uh, from advancing the desertification, or you know, spells practically continuous high island level hurricanes for countries like the Philippines, uh, and recently Dominica, who is in, who's, uh, in the LMDC. Uh, Dominica was just, just had a tropical storm, it wasn't even a hurricane. Okay, it was just a tropical storm. And they had bridges washed away. They had, uh, you know, I think uh, some somebody somebody said twenty something people had, had died. <laughs> and uh, you know, at first I thought twenty something is not that many people. Then then somebody told me entire population of Dominica. I said, okay, okay, that's a significant uh, proportion of the population. We think about it. Like Once again, it's, it's one and a half percent big or not? You know, one and a half percent isn't big. Under in, in the human realm of thought, okay, our proportion. But then we say, wait a minute, there are 200 countries in the world, and the average really is half a percent. Then you know, then all of a sudden it makes sense. Losing 20 something people in Dominica is a significant percentage of the population. You know, so there. Okay, I'm getting close to the end, but what I'm, I'd like to do now is to talk a little bit about um, some of these extra. UNFCCC processes that are being brought to bear. Like I said, I'm glad we raised uh, the issue of having uh, uh, Professor uh, Fredolin Tangang here to, to uh, give a talk because the IPCC is very important. 
it gives supposedly, okay, and I will give it like a, uh, uh, an unbiased scientific frame of reference for the negotiations under the US to inform the process. All right? The IPCC does not make recommendations. The IPCC synthesizes existing research and indicates whether the research is um, uh, the, the degree of consensus and the degree of certainty of the research, okay, based on its repeatability and based on whether or not uh, the uh, scientific community uh, is in agreement that that is indeed uh, a scientific fact. Okay, so uh, from that standpoint, the IPCC is um, an extremely important extremely useful organization, all right? Uh, and, and, uh, and, and for that reason, in fact, maybe, it is actually being used to try to co-opt the system, okay? Because as you know, as you may know, there are three uh, working groups in the IPCC. The first looks at the science of climate change, the second looks at the uh, uh, adaptation needs and disaster, and the third looks at mitigation. So it's a very, very slippery slope when you get in the mitigation part to say, okay, what mitigation technologies are available? Okay, then you say, well, what do you mean by available? It doesn't mean that, that if you had gobs and gobs of money, you could buy it. Or does it actually mean that, yeah, you could gain access to it, but your country needs to be in debt for about 25 years? Okay, or what does it mean? What does it mean? Does it mean that, that, that you, you could have that factory built right here? Okay, but the controlling state belongs on the other side. Okay, what does it mean? And then and so on. So you can you can move from there. You can see why there are so many problems. So, um, so bottom line, if you cannot win through the negotiations, find some way. Many ways you can bring political pressure to bear through the quote unquote informal ministerials. Look, uh, there have been a number of informal ministerials that are, will be perhaps a heads of state informal sometime. We've told the presidency, we've told France, don't have it in the first week of the COP because we will be busy working. We cannot put things down and go and cater to the needs of our heads of state. Don't have it before the COP, three days, four days before the COP. That is when we are coordinating. G77 and China has no other time to coordinate. We coordinate right before the COP. We need to coordinate to have something to talk about. Okay. Um, in the June session, the co-chairs took away two thirds of our negotiating time, uh, our coordinating time, and turned it to turned it to negotiating time. So literally, we found ourselves sitting here looking at no, we haven't coordinated something. Okay. So did they give us back our two thirds, you know, of negotiating time? No, they gave back one third this time. So you have a morning coordination, afternoon coordination, night time is negotiation. Okay. So. Were we able to say something? Yeah, we were able to say, but, but not as much as we could have said if we had coordinated and not a strong uh, position, a united position, if we had more time to coordinate. So they're putting pressure on us to say, you know, the G77 keeps bringing up process issues. This is, you know, it, it's, it's uh, not useful. It slows us down. It's a way of, it's a way of blocking the process. You know, we bring up uh, process issues because things are not working and we don't have time. If, if, if I can negotiate with you, it's because I've coordinated. If I don't coordinate, I cannot negotiate. Okay, we bent over backwards to agree to an experiment to take away two thirds of our negotiating time during one of the longer sessions, a two week session. All right, and what did you give us back? You said, Oh, yeah, we hear you loud and clear. In the one week session in October, we'll give you back one third of that time. All right. Now, there are enough parties in the UNFCCC who are progressive, who are saying, oh, there's no problem, we'll try one week uh, you know, with uh, one third less uh, coordinating time. But we know the rest of us really, really require all our, uh, all our coordinating time. Right? Very, very important. Um, in the IPCC, 
you can skew things in a number of ways. You can present discrete studies as comprehensive research. Kind of hard to do, but you can. You can overestimate potential and underestimate costs. This is what happens in most of the mitigation. They say developing countries have a lot of potential. You can really reduce. Okay, but if you don't have high emissions to begin with, how much can you reduce? An African state that is, is, you know, sub-Saharan uses fuel wood for emissions, supports a small population, you know, you already have low emissions, your per capita emissions are among the lowest. How much more can you reduce? Okay? And then they'll say, you know, your forest, zero cost, just don't cut it. <laughs> you don't have to spend any money, don't cut it. You know, but what's the opportunity cost? Okay? And even on that, they flip-flopped. Okay? They said, wait a minute, the EU is going to have a biofuel directive so that we can have renewable fuel for our cars. So immediately, countries went and cleared forests and planted biofuels. They said, oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, we are clearing forests. No, 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 no. Stop. <laughs> okay, too late, right? Okay? So, I mean, it's still a hit and miss thing for a lot of these things. So you underestimate the cost. Um, you ignore data that may not fit your narrative, okay? Or you create very interesting reference scenarios or baseline scenarios. And finally, uh, you can create very interesting uh, scenarios if you use some kind of, of, of interesting categorizations. For example, uh, on the, the most recent uh, uh, IPCC report, uh, in the uh, summary for policymakers, they tried to break countries into wealth class categories. Okay, but the interesting thing about this was they didn't fix what countries were going to be in what category from beginning to end. In other words, the world classes were mixed up as time progressed. If China was in one category, it was allowed to jump categories as time progressed. And yet, the main effects were reported by wealth category, but only at the end. So China is a middle-income developing country by the end. So there they were. Okay? But the emissions from the earlier time periods, okay, when China wasn't in that category, but in this category, okay, then those were kept constant. Essentially what they wanted to say was the middle income developing countries don't need help. We should put the finance there. What the middle income countries need to do is cut down their emissions. Okay? And how we can overestimate the potential, we can underestimate the cost. That's how. Right? And if you underestimate the cost is established, the cost is low, then you can do it yourself. You don't need to find it. Right? So once again, uh, uh, there are other ways of doing this, as I said, the political uh, ways outside as well, etc. etc. Um, okay, and as far as IPCC is concerned, the, there's this, this little cartoon which is kind of interesting, it goes from 1990 to 2009, and uh, that might be Prof Tang Lang. <laughs> I'm quite sure he hopes it's not him. 2019, uh, but essentially uh, the science is out there. Okay, the, the days of climate denialism are over. Okay, we should always, and we have always been, in fact, the scientists have been the most skeptical about climate change, and we need that. Okay? Climate skepticism, nothing wrong. Climate denial, big time wrong. Okay, mm -hmm. so no one really is is credibly denying climate change, right? It's just an issue of, of uh, how we are going to deal with this. And in the very immediate future, you've just got this left. We are done with the February session of the EDP, the June session, the July informal ministerial, August session, informal ministerial of Paris, and now what we have left is only FGHI. Okay? Ban Ki moon might have something uh, on the silence of the UN General Assembly. We might have, uh, we will have an October session, I'll be at the session. There may be a heads of state session to provide some political direction. And then come uh, COP21, there will be uh, the session in Paris. And for those of you who are going to be there, I hope uh, you will be there, you know, um, 
you could use your help. <laughs> okay, that is all I have. Thank you very much. I hope it's been We have time. Um, just uh, have a coffee. Uh, have a drink first. Uh, we have questions on the floor. Almost exactly. Yeah. So, no, we started like, so to the end of the. The worst thing is to book over time. It comes to the end of the plenary. We are going to go into Q&A, so that concludes this video. Bye-bye.